I'm excited to be here today. I'm speaking at a, a venue uh, that was opened by the, the wife of our Prime Minister. I, I, I've never spoken at such an illustrious event, I don't think. So I'd like to thank Gordon and uh, Jan for inviting me here uh, today. I really, really appreciate it. It's good to be here. Who, anyone here read this book? Just me? So it's written by a, it's written by an author in Toronto. He's a, he's a food writer type of thing, and he, he went around the world on the quest for the perfect steak. And um, if you're a cattleman, there'll be some things in there that brought me the wrong way, but I really enjoyed it because uh, it's a kind of a look into your customer, right? He's uh, he wants to eat high end beef in downtown Toronto, and uh, he wants to know what makes the best steak. And so and he does his research really well. So I'm, I'm, I don't get any uh, money for plugging his book, but. Uh, I think as people in the industry, uh, you would uh, you'd really appreciate that book. I think you know when we think about putting together the best steak, it's different than a lot of other commodities. So last night at the reception, I went up to get a beer. I could have had a Kokanee, or I could have had a Budweiser, or a Corona, or a Stella, or a number of other beers. Um, typically, when we go to a restaurant, you want a steak. How do you want it done? They don't say, "Do you want a do you want a grass-fed steak, or a corn-fed steak, or a barley-fed steak, long-fed, short-fed?" Uh, Wagyu, you um, know those are the brand, those are the varieties we have. It's typically, you know, we just we just have a steak. But I think just like we've got different tastes for steak, we've got different tastes. Just like we've got different tastes for beer, not everyone took the Corona uh, last night. Everyone was drinking all different types of beer. Different people have different tastes. And I think it's the same for beef. And uh, you know, Rob was talking about the world markets, and in those markets, they've got different tastes for beef. Some of those markets want really highly marbled beef. And beef of that marbling probably wouldn't sit very well with a lot of people in the audience. So there is different markets around the world um, when it comes to uh, when it comes to quality. So what do I want to get out of this? What do I want to get out of this talk today? I want to talk about you know why is, I'm talking a lot about beef tenderness and why so why is beef tenderness important? I'd like you to kind of go away with the message. Well, actually, beef tenderness is important. Uh, how can we improve it through genetics? And um, finally, a little bit of talk about how the industry might need to change to uh, actually improve tenderness. So Rob mentioned, you know, one of his goals is to put more money in, in uh, farmers' genes. I'd like to give the message today that the farmers have already, the money's already in the farmers' genes. It's not the, it's not the genes you're wearing covering your backside is the genes that are up in the pasture eating, uh, eating grass. Those genes are full of money and, um, and the goal of genomics really is to get that, uh, turn that money um, into something you can use. So what about, what, what, what do we know? We've, we've done a number of beef quality audits in Canada and the US and they, and they typically always come up with a similar, similar message and that is we need to do a better job with tenderness. So this is a recent one in Canada, 2009. 76% of consumers were satisfied with the tenderness of their steaks. So what does that mean? I think about, let's say I'm buying a car, and I'm driving to work, I drive to work every day, and um, I, can, I can't think of a day when my car didn't get me to work. Every day it gets me to work. What if one day in four, my car died at the side of the road? I didn't know what day it was gonna be, just randomly I get my car one day, and then all of a sudden, boom, it, it conks out the side of the road. It wouldn't matter if it's a Lexus, if it has leather seats, or a sunroof, or a great stereo. I think that car, I'm not happy with that car. So there's, I think, you know, when it comes to tenderness, our beef product has got to be tender. At that point, it doesn't matter what you got from marbling. It doesn't matter how juicy it is. If it's not tender, um, I think our customer is not happy with that steak. At the bottom there, um, you know, we're, in terms of complaints, the, the biggest complaint there is toughness. Basically, if a consumer had a complaint, Almost 40% uh, of that, those complaints were due to uh, were due to beef toughness. So I don't think we can look at the consumer those consumer audits and say you know beef tenderness doesn't really matter. <clears throat> what about stateside across the border? Beef quality audit from 2005. Now this is this is basically if you ask um, purveyors, retailers. Um, and restaurateurs, you know, what, what's your quality concern with beef? Um, insufficient marbling, number one. Um, these next two are kind of related, I think. Cuts are too heavy, 
in, in consistency. If we get bigger cuts, we've got to cut the stakes thinner to get the same weight. It makes an inconsistent cut. That's not a good thing. And number four, there's inadequate tenderness. The other ones, juiciness, flavor, and palatability, and then finally we get into things that are related to too fat or too big or too bigger ribeyes. So what about insufficient marbling? There's number one. In some ways, we, we bring that on ourselves. So if you're in the if you're in the restaurant business and you say, well, we only serve AAA product, then suddenly the guy that's supplying that restaurant says, well, I can't get enough AAA product. So suddenly you got to get more marbling because um, that's my number one concern. I just got to supply the market. So, but I think in the, the fact that tenderness is up there is number four is pretty, pretty significant. I do push this button, but it, I just wonder if I'm pointing it in the right direction. Do I got to point it back there or point to you? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about marbling. You know, we have something in, in the US, we call it the quality grade. Um, and we, we talk about marbling as if it is quality. And so if, if we're really trying to improve tenderness, my message here today is we're not gonna do it with marbling. You know, the genetic correlation between tenderness and marbling is pretty low. So there's two or three studies that I um, put together there. They're both pretty, actually 0 0.25, 0 0.26 negative between those two studies. A negative is, is a positive thing. So more marbling is less shear force. So I talk about shear force. Shear force is based on this instrumental way we can measure tenderness. So we take a steak, we cook it to medium doneness, and we basically drill out cores through that steak of a half inch or three quarter inch, depending, depending on where you live in the world. And then we put it on a machine and we basically measure the force required to sever across those cores and it's measured in kilograms. So up the, up the uh, axis there is shear force in kilograms, and as you, what you can see there is there's actually very little relationship between the fat content in those steaks and the tenderness, so um, it doesn't show up very well. But you could easily get, you could easily get here's a steak. Um, it's one of our most tender steaks. It has a lot of fat, but it's no more tender than this steak down here that has almost no fat. So, you know, that, that if you've ever um, patterned a shotgun, that, that graph there is almost like a shotgun pattern. There's really no relationship between, uh, between beef tenderness and, um, and uh, marbling. Another thing related to marbling, I think in the previous graph with the NCBA audit, they said basically, you know, um, not enough retail yield, poor cutability, too much back fat was basically, was basically the, uh, the issue there. <clears throat> the relationship between marbling and lean yield is also really small. You know, a negative, a similar correlation. So we can definitely find cattle that have more marbling, but also have decent lean yield. We don't have to give up lean yield if we want to select, if we want to select for marbling. Or we could maintain marbling and actually improve lean yield very easily. And that was some work, um, this work I'm quoting here. Reynold Bergen, he works for Canadian Cattlemen. A lot of people in the audience might know Reynold. Did his PhD with me and that was his, uh, that was his PhD thesis. So some of the pictures, I've, I tried to pick up some pictures today with Herefords, and I was invited to speak in Uruguay, um, 2007, I think it was, at, uh, at a meeting with the, with the uh, Uruguay and Hereford Association. And this is a picture I took. Um, they had a great barbecue, and they have these great barbecues. Uh, they cook steaks a bit different than we do. Um, and it was, it was great. It was great beef. And so I've kind of turned my, I so often show this picture, actually. Uh, so there's pictures of Uruguayan beef have been shown all over Canada for all of you from Uruguay here today. Um, but I kind of coined my, my project, this project, the No More Tough Steaks project. So we know we've got a toughness problem, um, and let's try and overcome it. And one way we can overcome it is with genetics. So I'd like to be right up front. You know, if we think about all our traits, whether it's, um, whether it's meat quality or, or uh, uh, marbling, you know, they're, they're related to uh, genetics, but there's also a big environmental component. And so a lot of these traits have got a heritability around 20% or something. That means 20% of the variation that we see is due to genetics, and the other 80% is actually due to management. So we could have genetically the most tender cattle in the world if we mess up on the management, if we mess up in the packing plant, if we cold shorten that meat, if we don't age it, um, we're gonna have tough steaks. So we're, there's no silver bullet here, but you know, if we get the genotype right, uh, we're gonna have great beef. That's not, it's just one more tool in the toolbox. So it's a multifaceted problem. We gotta get the management right. But like Rob said, it's the raw product at the beginning um, is the genetics. The cattle going in kind of governs a lot of what you can do down the chain. So they can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear uh, for, a, for a Canadian expression. So let's, let's, let's give them uh, some silk purses to begin with. 
So I'll show some results here for uh, some tenderness, and this is, this is from our own research herd at the University of Guelph. Unfortunately, we don't have, um, I don't have any uh, Hereford results here to show today, but I've got three other breeds I'm gonna show. On this, on these, on this graph, basically, um, Brian Wickham showed yesterday kind of an across-breed uh, genetic evaluation, and this is what we've done within the research herd is an across-breed genetic evaluation, basically for that shear force trait. So negative is better, less shear force. Think about uh, when we actually do shear force measurements, we might have animals at two kilograms, we might have animals at 10. So imagine having you know, a 10 kilogram weight strapped on your chin as you're chewing versus a two kilogram weight. There's a big difference in, uh, in the shear force of the meat. And so this is the, um, kind of the difference. Each of these spots on the graph are different bulls. So here's an Angus bull that's up this end of the scale and here's a much more tender Angus bull down this end. And what you can see here is there's big overlap between each of these breeds. So it's very easy, it's gonna be very easy to pick, say, a Simmental bull here that's more tender than some of the Angus. Although the mean for Simmental is higher than the mean for Angus. So there's some breed differences here, and there's also um, a lot of individual animal differences. So if we wanna select animals for better tenderness, the job is done. I've already identified the most tender bulls, we can use them. Problem is, by the time I've done, A, it's very expensive. So there's, you know, a thousand, there's over a thousand steers have been fed and collected their steaks and cooked them and shear forced them. Um, and all that meat is basically uh, cost you money. So that's expensive to do. So doing it this way, it really doesn't, uh, really doesn't work. So what I'd like to promote today is actually using genomics. So that pricing test is expensive. Let's use the progeny test data we have, identify the genes that are actually influencing tenderness, and actually select for, uh, select based on DNA. So when, when we talk about genomics, we talk about um, the hard traits. What are the traits that are really hard to improve uh, using traditional measurements, using traditional means? So something like yearling weight, well that's not hard to improve. We've been doing that for a long time. We can weigh cattle cheaply, easily, um, so we can move yearling weight, but we don't do a very good job with something like tenderness. So let's do it with genomics. So I'll let, I'll do just a quick little uh, description of um, genomics and, and SNPs. I know Dorian's gonna get up here after me and, and talk a lot more about this. But I heard a really good uh, description once by Jim Womack from Texas, uh, who's involved with sequencing the, uh, the first bovine, and basically said uh, the challenge that he says in sequencing the bovine, he says you basically, you've got a sequence that's made up of four characters, uh, G, C, T, um, and A. So imagine a typewriter that's got four keys on it, and we could start reading off the genetic code of this animal. Um, there's three billion of these uh, letters, so we could start reading off the genetic code in this animal that I've got up there right now. He's a C, G, T, A, A, T, C, G, T, A, C, T, A, G, T, and just type out the code, four letters, and if we never hit return on the typewriter, and the font was in like what you can read on your page there, 10 characters to the inch, we basically have a ribbon of tape stretching pretty much across Canada from one end to the other in 12 point font. That would be a bull's complete sequence. So that, that's just mind boggling amount of information. So you look at uh, those two sequences I have there encircled is a difference. There's a difference between those two. It's all the same except for that one spot and that spot is a nucleotide. If each of those are nucleotides, a single nucleotide there is different. It's a polymorphism. Single nucleotide polymorphism is a SNP. So we've got, we've got one SNP there. And you might say, okay, we've got three billion of these letters stretching from coast to coast across the country. We change one from a G to a C. What difference does that make? Well, it can, in some cases, it can make really big differences if you deal with genetic defects and things. Um, in this case, uh, we dealt with a SNP in, in a, a gene related to tenderness and it actually had a significant effect. So one little base change um, can have a big effect on the uh, genotype of the cattle. <coughs> So what effect is, I'll show you some results now for tenderness. So this is, this is actually, these are, this is the distribution. So all those bulls that I showed and we had uh, all their sons measured for tenderness. This is the actual distribution that um, was in those cattle. And what you find is there's some cutoffs and I uh, welcome to the science, but somebody's done some work to say at what point do most consumers say the beef is tough and at what point do beef consumers say it's tender? And those are those two lines up there. Um, and in the middle, some people think it's tough and some people think it's tender. So in our data, we had basically, again, one in four steaks 
that are tough based on that shear force. So it ties in pretty much the same as what we found in the canned beef quality audit. So we're not that much different. So let's look what happens, same graph, but I take those steaks now because we, we age steaks for seven days, 14 days, 21 days, et cetera. So I age the steaks for 14 days, what happens? It starts to shift to the left and basically, so we don't have as much variation in tenderness um, and we certainly don't have as many falling into the tough category. So I was, you know, 27% tough. Now we're dealing with about 6% tough, guaranteed tough with um, 14 days of aging. I go to 21 days of aging. Now I've pretty much eliminated that tough category. Uh, but I still got lots of animals that are in the middle that are, you know, some people think it's tough and some people think it's, some people think it's tender. So we could fix a lot of tenderness problems with aging. Aging is a great tool. Uh, and I was, my, one of these things where you bump into people and this woman worked for Cisco Foods and she was the head of like protein and meat and things for Cisco Foods and you know, what do you do? And oh, I work at the university and, and I said, well, we're working on this genetics for tenderness thing and I talked about it and uh, you know, we could get the same, the same tenderness with last days of aging. Well, she just about jumped off her chair. She says, I've got a warehouse in, in Texas. She says it's stacked from floor to ceiling uh, with, with stuff. It's got to be aged for so many days. If I could move that stuff out one day earlier, she said she would, that, would, that was huge. It was huge for her. Um, so I think there is a real economic, uh, some economic advantages to tenderness. So basically, I talked about this one SNP. We found one SNP in a, in a gene called calpostatin. It's, um, it's a Candidate, it's an obvious candidate if, if you study, you know, how beef might become more tender as it ages. And basically, uh, we did a, a bunch of validation work. And what, what you see is as we increase the number of copies of the favorable allele, which is the C allele, uh, we basically start to shift that distribution um, to the left. So that's just one SNP. So this is, it's a, it's a big SNP, um, has a big effect. So we're not going to find this in all, in all the SNPs we look at, but uh, it was... Uh, it's a, fairly, it's a fairly good news story. Um, kind of the bad side of the story is uh, it's actually fairly frequent. So in our animals, for example, in this, what we call my Allura population, which is where the research station is, 60%, actually the frequency is 60% um, of the is, is C, 40% is G. So they're actually more frequent for the favorable allele. So our, our ability to actually change that population isn't as, isn't as great. And that's why that distribution doesn't, doesn't uh, change very much. Um, so this, this SNP was actually validated in a number of other studies. Uh, in the US as well as in, in Canada, and it had very, pretty much the same impact of close to 0.2 kilograms of shear force. So that's, that's actually a pretty, big, uh, a pretty big effect. Okay, so I'd like to jump, jump category. So I talked about one SNP. Now we're gonna talk about what about if we use a lot more SNPs? And so I know Dorian's gonna talk about this 50K SNP chip, and a lot of you will be using it already maybe in your in your cattle breeding, but we genotyped all our animals for this 50K SNP chip, over 2,000 animals. And we also genotyped um, for another panel, which was 6,000 SNPs, but it was actually a custom panel we put together based on SNPs in genes that we thought were related to tenderness. And we put the two, we put the two together. And basically what you see here is you get all kinds, when you do your analysis, you just get all kinds of significant SNPs. They're just, there's lots of them. Um, and the challenge is there's, we know there's more, they look significant, but they're, they're maybe not significant. So we have to do some, do some validation work. So we kind of ratch up, ratchet up, you know, the significance thresholds. And at the bottom there, we basically were down to like 18 SNPs, the highly, highly significant um, from the 50K and five from our custom, custom 6K. So we've got these, we've got these, uh, these SNPs and let's see, let's see how they work out. So. What happens is we've, now I've got two populations, I've got this Allura population, which is our, our research population, but we also buy some cattle from producers. So they're like bought in cattle, they're not, um, they're not from, our, from our herd. And we basically train the SNPs, you know, how, how are these SNPs related to tenderness, come up with our associations based on um, our Allura, and then we say, well, let's validate these uh, in the other cattle. And what you find is basically, it does really well, and you can train the SNPs really well in your own population. It's at the, you know, the, the accuracy there is like 0.95. It's really high. But then when you go to see how it works in some totally unrelated cattle, it drops. We expect it to drop, 
And, uh, but this, co this correlation here of 0.4 is actually fairly high. So, you know, the equivalent, the equivalent of this result is, let's say I had year, I'm, I'm trying to work with yearling weight in cattle, and I got a bull, he finishes test, I take a, a yearling weight measurement on him, and I get a certain accuracy. What's the value of his own record for yearling weight? This is basically what's the value of his own record for shear force. If we actually took that animal, killed him, and, and cooked his steak, and shear forced it, and estimated the breeding value for him, I'm going to do similar accuracy, it looks like, based on these results um, with, with this uh, 50K, with this 50K result. So that, that's pretty good. I, 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 uh, I'm happy with that, and actually, uh, when I got off the plane yesterday, these results were brand new for me in my inbox, so I had people working to try and put that together. I was glad it came together. So that's, so, okay, so I kind of, I hope I've convinced you, okay, tenderness, I think, is important. Um, we can start to address it with genomics, and we've got some SNPs available now if you're dealing with Pfizer or, or uh, Igenity. Um, there's SNPs on there, and that SNP I talked about was part, is part of the Agenity panel. They're, they work for, for tenderness, and that's been shown. And with the 50K data coming down the pipe, we're going to have more accuracy for tenderness. So ge genomically, you've got a chance to start to change your population. Now I'd, like to now I'd like to address the issue, why? Why or how, why do you want to change and um, produce more tender beef? So the big issue is consumers say they want it, um, but unless somebody pays for it, Producers aren't going to do it. Um, I was really happy to see all the country presentations um, yesterday because a lot of them talked about branded beef products, right? They were showing in, in my country, here's a number, two or three Hereford, Hereford products in their country. Um, you know, so what's, if you're really trying to get, get a leg hole with your, with your product in those countries, um, you know, is there an opportunity then you could start to set yourself apart by, you know, we only take the top X percent of animals for genetics for tenderness or something and start to uh, move your population for tenderness a little bit. So another, Her another Uruguay and Hereford picture uh, that I took at their bull test station. But let's, you know, let's give a real life example. These bulls just came off test, they're ultrasounded, they've got new EBVs now for all the traits. And if you think about Brian Wickham's index for yesterday, you know, maybe the bull here in the middle with his mouth open is the highest indexing bull. So he's gonna make the most money. Uh, the bull in the back here, he's not quite as high indexing, but you know what? Genomically, he's the highest tenderness bull that we've ever seen in Herefords. So who are you going to use? Are you going to use, nobody's paying you for tenderness. Are you going to use that bull and give up some weight and et cetera and um, some ribeye and everything else and, and uh, um, go for the tenderness that you're not getting paid for? That's, uh, that's, that's the real issue, I think. We've got the tools. We know there's a need, but we're, unless the producers are going to get paid, um, there's not going to be that uh, pull, and that's the word that Rob used, uh, was market pull. So I, I see um, genomics is actually a way to enable kind of market pull. So we talk about this value chain. If you've ever tried to push a chain, it doesn't work. You have to pull a chain. So it, ha it has to come from the end. The people act actually selling the beef at the end of the chain have got to pull it through, um, and they've got to do it with dollars. So you know, unless there's someone out there that's selling a more tender beef product and he's willing to pay a nickel a pound more for steers, um, there's not going to be anybody really that's doing anything about beef tenderness from a genetics perspective. But if there was, you know, if, if there's a packer they're saying, well, we're going to pay a nickel a pound more um, for animals that have these genomic scores for tenderness, um, we can do it. You know, I've got, I stole this picture from the Canadian Cattlemen's website, but you know, we've got these animals, and maybe this is one of these white-faced wieners I heard about yesterday, I don't know. But, uh, you know, we've got an ear tag here. Um, every place that, if we took a piece of DNA when we got that ear tag and genotyped that animal, when he shows up for sale in an auction mart, you know, his genomic score for tenderness could be there. His genomic score for cutability and, and uh, feed efficiency and other things could be there as well. And if the packer was paying a nickel or more, the buyer might say, you know what, I'm getting more for those calves with higher tenderness scores. I bet you, or maybe, I should pay a little bit more at the auction market for the calves. Suddenly, that changes the dynamic totally, because producers will jump through hoops for five, 10 cents a pound. Um, and as soon as, as soon as they start getting paid a little bit more, then they're gonna go out and say, well, I need a bull with better genomic scores. And the seed stock guys are saying, okay, um, these bulls with better genomic scores are, are getting more money. Uh, so I got to produce more, more calves like that. So I think 
genomics tied with our national ID system could actually be a way to uh, really expedite, expedite some genetic improvement um, in the country. So I'd like, this is my second last slide, I'd like to acknowledge um, our funders across Canada, both provincial governments in Ontario and Alberta. So I, I, I didn't give myself the introduction at the beginning. I am from Guelph, but I also have an appointment at the University of Alberta with Livestock Gen Tech. And so we've got uh, funding from both provinces and our federal governments and beef producers of both provinces here in uh, Canada, as well as the Beef Cattle Research Council, which has um, enabled this research to take place. So I'd like to wrap it up with a plug for another project, um, and that is we're, we're working on genetically characterizing the Canadian cow herd, including Herefords, and we're going to genotype over 1,000 Herefords in the project and sequence the most 30 most influential Herefords in the Canadian herd. And, I, and Gordon and Jeff Hyatt, they've got lists of, of who these animals are. And uh, I know a lot of you have probably seen the list, but I'd just like to give a plug. You know, if, if you if you got semen in your tank, if you've got old samples, uh, they could be very valuable, and we need to get rolling. Um, you know, we're, the time's ticking on the project. So if, uh, if you got a chance, Canadian, CanadaCow.ca, you know, got contacts for myself or there. And uh, we really need to get, uh, get some of these samples. So even if you just want to send up your semen inventory or something, it'd be great to uh, have a look at that. And thanks very much. We're a little, run a little bit behind schedule, um, but uh, we have time for two questions uh, for Steve. Yes, at the back. Hi, Dr. Miller. Uh, William Torres with IVRS. I'm just wondering if you've seen any results on the interaction of uh, feeding beta agonists with uh, tenderness. I haven't. Um, I know there's some people that have been looking at that, and uh, but I haven't seen those results. I think, yeah, no. So I, I can't can't comment directly because I haven't actually seen them. So, but I know there are some results around. And so, the, you know, behind that question, beta agonists have the potential to um, decrease tenderness. So the idea is if you have animals with the right genotype, could we feed a beta agonist and actually not, to, not uh, decrease? So we're going to get you know, better shear force because of the genotype, worse shear force because of the beta agonist. But on average, now we're, we're OK. So it might be we can feed beta agonists to these animals, and they're still acceptable. That, that's the idea. Time for one more question, if there's any out there. No? Uh, Randy, I'll ask you to present a gift to Steve. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Thanks. Thanks. Okay.